Stephen C. Meyer, The Return of the God Hypothesis. He really thinks that scientific discoveries point to the existence of a god? <sighs> oh, Mr. Meyer, you must be mistaken. Science and religion are not friends. We're at war. God is but a fairy tale to comfort the weak. It has no basis in science. Science has no need for God. It does not thunderstorm because gods are warring in the sky. Heavens no, we are way beyond such childish notions. Science has discovered the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology, which created the universe and all things in it, including life. Have you not heard of Darwin, Mr. Meyer? Life evolved from a single cell into all the living creatures based on natural selection acting on random mutations. There is no need for God to explain this, Mr. Ma. Science has not discovered God at the base of reality. It has only discovered matter, energy, and the laws that act upon them. And I know what you're going to ask. How was the universe created? Have you not heard of the Big Bang, Mr. Ma? or the quantum cosmologies of Hawking and Hartle. Yes, we can explain these things, and what we cannot currently explain will be explained as science progresses, and there will be a natural explanation. Do I make myself clear, Mr. Ma? Mystic Dan here. Now, don't be fooled by the intro. I'm actually a big fan of Stephen C. Meyer and all of his works. Uh, starting with Signature in the Cell, then he came out with Darwin's Doubt, and now his latest, The God Hypothesis, three scientific discoveries that reveal the mind behind the universe. And in this book, he adds an additional layer of evidence to his hypothesis that a god, or intelligent mind, is responsible for the universe and life within it. The book discusses three key findings in science that are best explained by the postulation of an intelligence. So those findings are, one, the universe has a beginning, which of course begs the question, how did it begin? Could the universe really be responsible for its own beginning? Number two, the constants of physics are finely tuned to allow for a universe in which stable galaxies, planets, and ultimately life can evolve. And three, DNA is an information-rich molecule, and the information it contains re resembles that of a computer code or written text. So we're going to get into each of these uh, one by one. Let's start with uh, the beginning of the universe. So Edwin Hubble was an astronomer who provided evidence that the universe was expanding as his observations showed that other galaxies were getting further and further away from our own. Furthermore, he found that the rate uh, at which other galaxies were retreating from ours is correlated with their distance from us. The further away, the faster they are retreating, as if the universe is being blown up like a big balloon. It follows then that as you trace time back, all the galaxies would get closer and closer together and eventually converge, making the beginning of the universe. Later on, working with Einstein's field equations, the Belgian priest and physicist Georges Lamatre, not sure how to say that, but he proposed a cosmological model which showed that the galaxies were not receding into pre-existing space, but in fact, space itself was expanding. Again, implying that if you, re if you rewound time, you would see the universe getting smaller and smaller until, as Stephen Hawking stated, quote, at some time in the past, the distance between neighboring galaxies must have been zero. In other words, the entire universe was squashed into a single point with zero size like a sphere of radius zero. Wait, ho ho hold on a second, what? Zero size? What? Yeah, uh, that's right. So if you think about it, if you take time back 
to the beginning, you eventually get to a T equals zero. If there is no time, there's also no space as time and space are a continuum. They are intricately interlinked in physics. So time equals zero, space equals zero. So in a, singular, in a singularity like that, both spatial and temporal dimensions cease to exist. So as Stephen Meyer used to ask his students, how much stuff can you put in no space? It seems like neither matter nor energy could exist in the absence of space. What would there be? Where would it be? I'm sorry, yeah, where would it be? But that is the Big Bang Theory, that the universe arose from nothing, essentially. And the Big Bang Theory is supported by other evidence besides the expansion of the, of the universe, such as the cosmic background radiation, which is a residual radiation of light left over from the early stages of the universe's expansion. Meyer points out the implications of the theory when he states, If some time in the finite past, either the curvature of space reached an infinite, and or the radius and spatial volume of the universe collapsed to zero units, then at that point there would be no space and no place for matter and energy to reside. Consequently, the possibility of a materialistic explanation would also evaporate, since at that point neither material particles nor energy fields would exist. Indeed, since matter and energy cannot exist until space and probably time begins to exist, a materialistic explanation involving either material particles or energy fields before space and time existed makes no sense. As I used to tell my students, if you extrapolate back all the way to a singularity, you eventually reach a point where there is no matter left to do the causing. Indeed, to clarify that point, the Big Bang Theory implies that time and space started or came into existence at some finite time in the past. Space and time begin when the universe begins at the beginning of the Big Bang. Before space, time, and energy popped into existence, there could be nothing material which existed because matter and energy are space-bound. So there could be no material cause to the universe. Therefore, any entity capable of causing the universe to come into existence must transcend space, time, matter, and energy. Um, and theism theorizes just that, that there is a transcendent God beyond the universe which caused the universe. Now, now I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Okay, there's a way around this. We, we can figure this out. I mean, okay, so yeah, yeah. Uh, what if, let's see, well, what if the universe didn't spring from a truly dimensionless, spaceless, timeless point but instead just came from a really tiny ball of space, time, and energy, you know, which I think is how most of us envision it anyway, as all the matter and energy of the universe just scrunched down into this really, really tiny, super hot, compressed, tight ball of energy. Well, the problem is, what caused it to explode and create our universe 13.8 billion years ago? If that tiny ball of compressed energy has existed for an infinite amount of time, why did it suddenly erupt 13.8 billion years ago? And when there was an infinite amount of time before that for it to erupt and create a universe, Yet our best evidence shows that the universe has only been expanding for 13.8 billion years. All right, all right, all right, all right. We, we got this, though. We got this. Okay. What if this just happens in cycles? Yeah, yeah, we got this. We got this. So, little tiny ball of energy, space, time, matter, whatever. Boom. Expand, expand, create the universe, then contract goes back into a tiny ball, then bam, quantum fluctuations, you know, um, cause it to explode again or whatever. It just keeps happening over and over. There's nothing outside the universe. It's just space, time, and energy eternally existing in that cycle of expansion and contraction. 
Yep, yep. Atheist one, Stephen Meyer zero. <laughs> yeah, see you later, Stephen. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. <laughs> we, we got this. We can explain it. Wait, what? Stephen Meyer has an explanation? Uh, uh, refutes that idea? Stephen, oh, you make it hard to be an atheist. Okay, what does he have to say? Well, Stephen Meyer does have an answer. Um, he explains in his book that MIT physicist Alan Guth demonstrated that the model we just described of an oscillating universe that continually expands and contracts runs into a problem with the second law of thermodynamics. That law states that the disorder or entropy of an isolated system of matter and energy will increase over time. So each time the universe went through one of these cycles, it would increase its overall entropy. And I'll just quote from Meyer's book here to make it easier. He says, quote, such increases in entropy or the disorderly distribution of mass energy would result in less energy available to do work in each cycle. That would cause progressively longer and longer cycles of expansion and contraction since increasing inhomogeneous in the mass energy density throughout space would decrease the efficiency of gravitational contraction. Yet if the duration of each cycle necessarily increases as the universe moves forward in time, then it follows that each cycle in the past would have been progressively shorter since the periods of each cycle cannot decrease indefinitely. The universe, even in an oscillating model, would have to have had a beginning. And furthermore, he points out that recent astronomical observations suggest the universe will most likely never recollapse because its mass density is less than the critical density necessary to stop the expansion. And there are other theories about what's expanding the universe and why it may never stop expanding. So we're back to theism. Stephen Ma. I want to be an atheist, and you're making it difficult. Now, that brings up a whole bunch of, other, uh, of unanswered questions, of course. If theism is true, that brings up questions about the nature of God. If God created the universe, what is, quote-unquote, God made of? And how does God create the universe? Where did the energy come from? So you could say, well, it came from God. Well, how does God make energy? Or is the energy of the universe a part of God? Maybe God is energy, sentient, intelligent, conscious energy, mind. And uh, we should also probably postulate that God is multidimensional, uh, meaning transcending the dimensions of, of our current reality. But those questions aside, uh, we do know from our experience as minds inhabiting human bodies or, or as brains, whatever, that we can freely choose to create new things that didn't exist before. Of course, our creations are confined to this physical world, but nonetheless, God as an agent with free will could presumably create something new like the universe. Now, before we end this section about a beginning of the universe, it must be said that there are other theories, including steady state theory, inflationary cosmology, and quantum cosmology, all of which are critiqued by Meyer in his massive nearly 600-page book. And I don't have time nor the expertise to really go through all that. So if you're interested in the full discussion of that topic, read the book and you'll find out why Meyer thinks all cosmological theories have theistic implications, whether or not they postulate a beginning to the universe. So moving on to postulate number two of why there must be a God, the universe is finely tuned to create a life-friendly universe. So you've got first the gravitational force constant, which could have been a number of different values but is finely tuned to one part in 100 billion trillion trillion, yes, that's one in 10 to the 35th power, to allow for the existence of stable stars in the universe. 
If the gravitational force was weaker, then stars wouldn't get hot enough nor develop the thermal layering necessary for the creation of many elements necessary for life, such as carbon and oxygen. If the force were much stronger, then stars would get too hot and that would only allow the creation of heavy elements and the stars would burn up much faster, i.e. not last as long. And there are many values and constants like this in physics which need to have a specific value to create a life-friendly universe uh, where you can have stable stars and planets and all the elements needed to create life. The electromagnetic force constant exhibits fine-tuning for a life-friendly universe of one part in 25. The strong nuclear force, one part in 200, and I could go on. Moreover, the ratios of the values of the different force constants require a high level of fine tuning. Meyer points out that the ratio of the weak nuclear force to the strong nuclear force constant had to have been set with a precision of one part in 10,000, otherwise hydrogen fusion powered stars necessary for life could not exist. And the ratio of the electromagnetic force to gravity must be accurate in one part in 10 to the 40th power, again, in order for a life-friendly, life-sustaining universe to have been created. Moreover, the initial configuration of mass energy at the beginning of the universe had to have been finely tuned uh, based on entropy. It had to have finely tuned entropy or order in order to create a life-friendly universe. Specifically, it had to be a low entropy, highly ordered configuration, because if not, you get either an extreme clumping of matter in the universe resulting in only black holes existing, or just a highly diffuse arrangement of matter without any large-scale structures such as galaxies or planets at all. Then there's the fine-tuning of the rate of expansion of the universe. As Meyer explains, if the universe were initially expanding even a smidgen faster or slower, either stable galaxies would not have formed in the universe because matter would have dissipated too quickly for galaxies to congeal, or else the universe would have quickly collapsed in on itself. And Meyer gives a nice visual representation of all these physical factors that must have been set just right in order for a universe to have produced stable galaxies, stars, and ultimately life. So you can see in this chart that I'm showing just how many factors had to be just right to create a universe like ours that can sustain life. Now we know that minds such as ours are capable of fine-tuning a system to produce a certain outcome. We need precisely manufactured parts and the precise arrangement of those parts to create our wonderful machinery, our cars, our computers, our beloved smartphones. So our repeated and uniform experience tells us that mind is capable of this kind of precision fine tuning to create a desired outcome, a machine with a desired function, a computer program, what have you. Okay, okay, it's, it's objection time. Atheists, come, come, join. We need to fight back. Here we go, atheists to the rescue. Let's see, let's see. Yeah, I got this, I got this. Finely tuned, ah, solution, solution. <laughs> Multiverse, Stephen Meyer. It's not just one universe. Dude, yeah, if it was one universe, that would make that would make you scratch your head like, how is it so finely tuned? No, there's an infinite number, Mr. Ma. <laughs> you see, there are many, many universes, so statistically, one of them, i.e. ours, or maybe probably a bunch of them, actually, statistically, if there's an infinite number, uh, a few of them are going to be life-friendly, and we just live in one of those. <laughs> Bye-bye, Meyer. We don't need your God hypothesis. <laughs> it's for children. <laughs> what? <sighs> Meyer, can you stop debunking our theories? Okay, tell us what he has to say. Well, okay, so there is the multiverse theory, but... Um, 
Meyer does critique that, of course. Uh, first of all, with the multiverse theory, there's Occam's razor to worry about. And that states that you should avoid multiplying theoretical entities when trying to explain phenomenon. A simpler explanation is better. Uh, simpler explanation being theism. Then there's the problem of the fine tuning of the universe generating mechanism. The need to affirm purely hypothetical entities, abstract postulates, and unobservable processes. The details of which I'll let you read in the book. But the biggest objection, I think, is the absurdities which an infinite multiverse theory postulates. I'll quote again from the book. According to quantum mechanics, there is a finite, if extremely tiny, probability of random fluctuations at a subatomic level, occasionally generating unexpected macroscopic outcomes, such as, for example, the Statue of Liberty waving at you as you fly by it in an airplane. Though such events will in all probability never happen in our solitary universe, any event with a finite probability of occurrence, however small, will inevitably happen in an infinite multiverse. Indeed, it will do so an infinite number of times. One such incredibly improbable event would be the production of a Boltzmann brain. In an infinite number of universes, an infinite number of such brains would exist. So you might ask, what is a Boltzmann brain? Well, it would be a brain that spontaneously appears due to random flu quantum fluctuations, complete with a false set of memories and perceptions. You could be a Boltzmann brain. And in fact, in these infinite multiverse theories, um, every possibility exists in some universe you know everything that can happen is happening somewhere in some universe so i really think we need to appeal to occam's razor here and as the philosopher richard swinburne put it quote it is the height of irrationality to postulate an infinite number of universes never causally connected with each other merely to avoid the hypothesis of theism Now, moving on to the third piece of evidence pointing to the existence of an intelligent mind behind the universe, we have the genetic code of life in DNA. Now, this to me is the most compelling and most obvious example of intelligence in the cosmos. Uh, he first laid this theory out in Signature in the Cell, and I remember really having an epiphany when I, when I read it. It just made so much sense, and I combined that theory with the evidence from near-death experiences to propose a source consciousness from which the universe and all beings originate in my book, Enter the Light, written many years ago. So what we need to understand is that at the heart of life, in the simplest cell, we find DNA. Now, what most people don't know is how DNA is like a digital code, similar to a computer program or written text. You see, DNA provides the instructions for building proteins, which are like the building blocks of life. Now, DNA has four chemical bases, which are arranged along the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA molecule. But notice there are no chemical bonds between the bases running down the spine of the backbone, which means there's no chemical affinity which bonds them together or determines their arrangement from top to bottom. Any of the bases can attach to any of the sites along that backbone. This makes the DNA molecule ideal for carrying specified information. So that's just it. DNA carries specified information, meaning it is complex as the information does not follow a repeating pattern and specified, meaning that a specific arrangement of bases performs a specific function. That function in many cases being the production of a protein. So as I explained in my article many years ago, a new view of consciousness and reality. There are four DNA bases represented by the letters A, C, T, and G, which are arranged into three letter combinations, essentially three letter words called codons. Now each codon or three letter word represents one of 20 different amino acids that link up in specified sequences to build proteins. 
Also, there are codons that specify when to start or stop the building of a protein. Amino acids form proteins by linking together one at a time based on the DNA instructions and then folding into three-dimensional structures, uh, which the specific three-dimensional structure of the protein determines its precise function. If the amino acids are not arranged in the proper order, a functional protein will not be produced. Therefore, if the bases in DNA are not arranged properly to code for the right amino acids in the right position along the protein chain, then the amino acids will not link up properly and a functional protein will never be made. Now, even a simple protein requires a chain of 100 plus amino acids. Again, arranged in a specific order. So to encode for even a simple protein requires that 300 plus bases of DNA be arranged in a specific order to code for the correct amino acid order to build the, pro to build the protein. Okay, so in Signature in the Cell, uh, Meyer points out that studies have been done to try and determine uh, you know, out of all the possibilities, out of all the possible ways of arranging amino acids, how many of those possibilities would actually produce a functioning protein? And he gives one study in his book which says the chances of producing any functional protein of 150 amino acids in length by combining those amino acids by chance is one in 10 to the 74th power. That means there's only one chance, there's only one arrangement out of 10 to the 74th possibilities for um, an amino acid chain 150 long to get a functioning protein. The vast majority of arrangements of those amino acids will not create a functioning protein. So you start to see the problem. Um, basically, random mutation of the DNA digital code is much more likely to degrade function, i.e. not lead to the coding of functional proteins. Well, not lead to the coding of functional proteins, lead to the breaking of function and the creating of non-functional chains of amino acids much more likely to happen than it is to stumble upon a new functional protein. It would be like randomly changing the letters in a paragraph of written text. The more you do that, the more you make the text incomprehensible. Or if you randomly change the ones and zeros of a computer code, you are much more likely to break the computer program than to enhance its function. Now, Random mutation um, and natural selection can be beneficial. There are specific um, instances where it can help uh, an organism survive, and but there are limits to that. And I, I suggest the book, The Edge of Evolution by Michael Behe, if you're really interested in knowing what random mutation, natural selection, what that mechanism is capable of and what are, what are its limits. But as far as creating proteins, which we in our body have many hundreds, maybe thousands of different kinds, uh, the random mutation, even if given the whole span of 13.8 billion years to try and you know, uh, get the right combination to create proteins, you're still one in 10 to the 74th power. That's a huge number. That's you know, not going to happen by a random process. Okay, so I do want to also say Richard Dawkins tried to show how evolution could work by programming a computer program to produce the sequence, me thinks it is like a weasel. The computer program uh, worked by randomly changing letters until it hits upon the sequence. But the only problem with that analogy is that Dawkins had to first give the program the target sequence. He had to program in this is this is the you know the sentence you're looking for so if a letter starts to match up in the right place you need to preserve that okay so only by giving the computer program the target sequence 
did the computer program know which letters to preserve? And the problem is natural selection has no future goal in mind. So if you start randomly changing the, the DNA bases, well, you know, natural selection cannot select, cannot preserve that in, because it has no way of knowing if in the future, after 200 other changes are done to the DNA, some new protein will be coded for. There is no future selection. Natural selection selects now. How can we survive now? What is beneficial for survival now? So that is the real problem. Okay, so where am I? Yeah, so we only know of one source that can create this kind of specified information, human minds. We create written texts which are highly very specifically arranged and highly improbable arrangements of letters which confer meaning or function, you could say, to the reader. So basically the evolutionary theory has an information problem. Where does the information come from to create life and evolve it into the many different creatures we have today? Now, there are various um, theories which Meyer goes over in the book. If you're interested, like the RNA world hypothesis, he goes over that. If you're interested in that, you could pick up this book. But really, his newest book is mostly about um, the fine-tuning and the beginning of the universe and cosmological models. So I suggest if you're interested in that topic, pick up his earlier works, Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt. Now, in my opinion, uh, the universe is a part of God. It exists within God. Indeed, if God is all that exists fundamentally, then everything that exists exists within God. The universe is a small part of God, you could say. The mind, the energy of God, is in every being, every particle of the universe, because every being, every particle is God. God is the mind behind the universe. In the universe and he, she, it, I don't know what to call God, but uh, I don't have any pronouns for God. But anyhow, God guides the evolution of the universe and life intelligently. Now, let's talk about why Stephen Meyer called his book The Return of the God Hypothesis. What do you mean return? Well, interestingly, um, early scientists, most prominently Newton, had a very strong faith in God. You see, early scientists believed that God created an orderly cosmos, and this orderly cosmos was governed by God. They sought to discover the laws by which God governed the universe. Thus, Newton stated in the general scholium of the Principia, Quote, in him, all things are contained and moved. It was God who created the, this orderly universe, and we, created in his image, may discover the thoughts or ideas or the mathematics by which God created and sustains the cosmos. And I leave you with that, my friends. Um, hey, if you like these videos, consider subscribing or even donating to the channel. I'll put the PayPal link below if you'd like to donate and keep this channel going. Uh, take care. Hey, if anybody out there watching is tight with Stephen Meyer, put in a good word for me. I would absolutely love to get him on for an interview. Uh, there are some questions I'd like to ask him. Now, probably our next video, I'm thinking about reading the book, uh, The Third Man Factor by John Geiger, which explores, uh, talks about the experiences of people in extreme situations like climbing Mount Everest or being trapped in a burning building and sensing a presence there with them, often a comforting and guiding presence. So we're going to explore that topic next in all likelihood and stay tuned.